Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the United Nations Security Council and how it really plays a critical role in helping or trying to help resolve some very difficult situations. My guest today is an expert on the UN Security Council. My guest today is His, is, is his Excellency Ambassador Hardeep Puri, who is the permanent representative of India to the United Nations from 2009 to 2013. Ambassador Putty has also recently written a very interesting book on the United Nations and the Security Council titled Perilous Interventions, the Security Council and the Politics of Chaos. Your Excellency, Ambassador Putty, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's get right into your book. It's a very interesting book, very timely book and one that will be very informative, I'm sure, for our viewers. What is the main thrust of it? I hope I didn't give the secret away when <laughs> I gave the title, but what is the main thrust of the book? This book is about decision-making in the Security Council. So let's start at the beginning. Why is the Security Council important? It is important because it is the only designated entity in the global system which has the authority to make a determination whether there exists a threat to peace and security. In other words, countries are allowed to go to war under two conditions. One, if that country has been attacked and you use force in self-defense. The second condition for the use of force is if the Security Council makes a determination that there exists a threat to international peace and security in which case the Security Council authorizes what is called within quotes all means necessary mm -hmm. which is a euphemism for the use of force now in the case of Iraq in 2003 some permanent members of the Security Council came there and asked for authorization for the use of force because they said that there were weapons of mass destruction and they mm -hmm. provided a dossier but a skeptical Security Council refused to be persuaded so the military operation in Iraq in 2003 was carried out without legitimate council authorization. It was an operation carried out by the Coalition of the Willing and subsequently, as we've discovered, the Chilcot Committee report in the United Kingdom has held Prime Minister Blair guilty in terms of uh, the actions which were taken. They were taken on the basis of false uh, information, information which hadn't been verified. More recently, the Council authorized the use of force in the case of Libya through Resolution 1973. My book deals with the situation in Libya in the beginning of 2011, with Syria, with the use of force in Yemen, in Ukraine. It also deals with the doctrine of responsibility to protect. So it is a book about the interventions the Council has made and many of which have gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Security Council. There are six organs of the United Nations. The General Assembly with 193 member states, basically every country in the world, is a member of the UN General Assembly, but their resolutions are non-binding. The Security Council, which is the entity that deals with peace and security and international stability, their resolutions are binding, as you alluded to. And of course, there are 15 members, five permanent members of the Security Council of the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. But when they issue a, re a resolution, it is binding on the parties. You mentioned the Iraq War, 2003, is a very, very important event that took place. And at that time, as you so accurately stated, there was a circumvention of the Security Council. I remember Kofi Annan, who was Secretary General at that time, said that of all his eight years at the UN, his greatest regret was not being able to stop the Iraq War. That was the one thing that he thought surely was absolutely essential. And we see that that has helped destabilize the Middle East to a large degree. What, uh, before we get off of Iraq, we'll get into Libya in just a minute. What uh, can the UN do to help promote stability in a post-Iraqi invasion? Well, I think Mr. Anand went a step further, if I may. Uh, well, he, he said, I mean, yes. apart from regret, um, which he expressed as Secretary General mm -hmm. in not being able to prevent the Iraq war, he also, uh, in a speech he made in Geneva, when I was permanent representative uh, there, he was addressing the Human Rights uh, Council. And he very clearly stated uh, in that speech that the action had been taken outside the framework of law. 
and he appealed to uh, those who had used force to uh, to observe the uh, system of law and to you know adhere to the geneva conventions and so on the difficulty here is that um, the council has the decision making power mm -hmm. to authorize the use of force not all council decisions have to be binding mm -hmm. but a decision which has been taken uh, as a result of a resolution under chapter 7 mm -hmm. uh, that has the force of um, law and uh, there is uh, authority to use force in the case of iraq clearly with the benefit of hindsight uh, the international community uh, those who decided to use force were wrong Uh, that was not the best way of handling it and it resulted in the devastation of iraq and that mistake was compounded in the case of libya mm -hmm. but in the case of libya it was authorized the council authorized the use of force but the handling of that force and uh, the arming of rebels which is another issue my book picks up uh, the two together resulted in a toxic uh, combination and the unraveling of a country in the case of syria which followed subsequently the chinese and the russian said well you know you have man manipulated the security council mm -hmm. in the case of uh, libya and they would not be party to a council decision now that in my view is equally wrong but the security council's effectiveness is essentially based as you said it has 15 members it is based on at least those five members being on the same page because when you are dealing with a situation which deals with the use of force and threats to international peace and security there must at least be a common perception now the security council has to deal with these cases very carefully in the case of libya i say in the book with the benefit of hindsight not only but because i was a participant in in that decision making mm -hmm. the decisions were not discussed properly they were not thought through and in it seems now with retrospect clearly that some of the countries which wanted to use force wanted to do so because they had regime change in mind they wanted to get rid of gaddafi now gaddafi was not a popular leader he was uh, unpopular amongst all the 15 members so what happened is resolution 1970 went through in february and resolution 1973 also went through because few of us abstained the russians the chinese the indians the brazilians and the germans we abstained on the resolution but the way the resolution unfolded uh, after they got authority to use force they didn't stop they went on using force and that country now stands unraveled now iraq 2003 libya 2011 and syria ongoing all i can say is that these three decisions are entirely or in in great part responsible for the creation of monsters like isis because it is this decision making which has contributed to the chaos which was already there that's why the book says the security council and the politics of chaos mm -hmm. let's touch on those three very I just very briefly have a question for you you mentioned Iraq and the Chilcot inquiry which the United Kingdom did i think it took 7 or 8 years to to produce this to identify exactly what went wrong why britain joined the united states and today the invasion of iraq is widely viewed as two different items one as an illegal invasion of a sovereign country you mentioned how Kofi Annan viewed it and today many many uh, uh, well jurists many uh, lawyers many legal minds view it that way the second thing with iraq a lot of people are saying why has the united states not done a chilcot inquiry to determine how information was manipulated perhaps uh, deformed uh, there was misinformation disinformation that type of thing so the united states may need to think about having its own inquiry into this libya when the forces went in they were to set up a no fly zone as i recall and really it was following up on the concept of the responsibility to protect r2p which came out of a 2005 conference that was adopted in 2005 at the united nations talk a little bit about the r2p and how the really the goal was a very laudable goal but mission creep came in and it went far beyond what it was intended to be so brill you're absolutely on target you're absolutely right but the chilcot committee was followed in the uh, in united kingdom with what what is called the blunt committee it was a select committee of the house of commons mm. which has indicted prime minister cameron mm. 
on Libya. So that has happened. You're right. The United Kingdom has instituted these two um, inquiries. Uh, Chilcot Committee took a long time in uh, seeing the light of day, but the Blunt Committee came out very quickly. In fact, uh, um, somebody called me from uh, London and he said that, uh, have you seen the Blunt Committee? I said, well, I had written this book a year ago. It's only coming out now. Much of what the Blunt Committee covers is in this book. Now, why the United uh, States does not have inquiry committees like this or commissions? Well, let's be very um, candid about this. Uh, the decision makers who are in power will never institute an inquiry uh, 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 on their own actions. But uh, the president-elect, uh, 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 Mr. Trump, has said on several occasions that the policy on Libya uh, has been wrong. He has, in fact, um, gone much further than that. Uh, my purpose is not to inject myself into the American domestic debate, but if you read my book on, I think, somewhere around page 31 or so, I have covered the rise of ISIS, and I've quoted American figures, uh, very prominent pe uh, people like Vice President Biden. But one of the people I've quoted was the then head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General Michael Flynn. Now, he may be the next uh, national security advisor. Uh, he admits, and he's on record, to say that some of the policies which were followed by the West, uh, they were intended to support groups which uh, could counter uh, Salafist extremists and counter, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Assad, the president um, uh, in Syria. And those uh, policies went hopeful, uh, uh, hopelessly wrong. Now, whether there will be a corrective on that, whether the incoming administration will deal with the issues relating to the use of force, but it's a very timely subject, and it's going to resonate here. I only hope that uh, in the interest of global politics, issues like um, arming of rebels and the use of force will be considered very, very carefully. You know, the United States had a program of $500 million, which I cover in this book, uh, to train and arm the so-called moderate opposition. And uh, to lo and behold, one day they discovered that the guys who had been trained and armed had crossed over to the other side. So one of the things the book talks about is that there are no moderate or good or bad rebels. Arming of rebels is a bad thing, and it invariably has negative consequences which are not anticipated. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you are involved with any type of media outlet or any type of effort to help inform the public, such as a PBS station, community access television, or perhaps you're with a university that, or an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or even if you just have a website and you would like to share our programs with your family, friends, colleagues, and the community at large, please feel free to do that. Go to the website, download any of the programs. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge, at no cost, as a public service to help us better understand how international issues do impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at a very important topic and a very important organization. And my guest today is Mr. Uh, is the Ambassador uh, Hardip Puri, who is the ambassador from India to the United Nations from 2009 to 2013. And we're looking at a very interesting book that he has written on the UN Security Council, Perilous Interventions, the Security Council, and the Politics of Chaos. Ambassador, we are focusing on this. We've talked about Iraq to a large degree to, with Libya. Let's shift to Syria. This is, I think everyone is in agreement, this is truly the, the tragedy of, of the decade. It's been unfolding now for four or five years. What, what role did the Security Council play in Libya or did not play, and what role should it play to try to help bring stability to uh, just a, this war-torn, ravaged country? Bill, I think uh, Syria is not just the tragedy of the decade it may t end up as the tragedy of seven decades of the UN's existence. Uh, what is happening in Syria constitutes, to my mind, the most severe and damning indictment of the Security Council's functioning. Their de devastation and destruction in Syria have been horrific. The hundreds of thousands of people displaced, the humanitarian uh, crisis, it's truly tragic. And the Security Council, as a result of what happened in Iraq and Libya, 
is stalemated. So all I can say is the devastation that has taken place, it should have stirred the conscience of the international community five years ago. But now, I think the time has come with a new administration uh, ready to take charge in um, Washington. I hope that both Washington and Moscow can sit across the table, resolve their bilateral differences, and then both should show leadership and lean on the other stakeholders, the Russians, on the Iranians, the uh, Americans, on the Gulf states, on Saudis. What we need is a simple game plan of the kind that Kofi Annan had, which I cover in the book, a six-point plan, where there must be an immediate cessation of hostilities. Both sides or all the warring disputants must walk back from the violence. Mm -hmm. This funding and arming of rebels has to be stopped. You must give the Syrians an opportunity to have a genuine, all-inclusive Syrian peace process and let them work it out. Syria is tragic no matter which way you look at it. In the good old Ottoman days, you had independent governorates, one for the Alawites, one for the Kurds, etc., and they coexisted. And in came the turn of the century, you had the Sykes-Pico um, uh, pact, where Mr. Sykes, who was supposed to be a great expert on the Middle East, he sat in the war office in London and drew a line, acro line across the sand, and he said, this will be the division of spoils between uh, France and uh, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. I mean, this is an act of madness committed by an imperial cartographer, which the world has then come to uh, suffer from. But there are other tragedies. I mean, Bashar al-Assad and his father, Hafiz Assad, in 1982, he had also used the brute force when the Hama massacre took place. So I think the time has come now to say enough is enough. Every party or stakeholder has to walk back and you must have peace. Because Syria, as Kofi Annan said, uh, when he said well, Libya has exploded, but so Syria will not only implode, but the consequences in the other countries of the region will be very serious. And, and the double vetoes exercised by the Russians and Chinese have been count completely uh, unhelpful in this. And even though at this point, even though the Security Council has been deadlocked on this, uh, the Russians and the United States in particular, still the United Nations has been on the ground helping the people of Syria, the UN World Food Program, the UN High Commission for Human Rights, I the see, UN I see. system. The whole community. Exactly. But they're, they're there to it, help. They're, they're finding it difficult to get the humanitarian uh, assistance right. in. Now, yes. you cannot, um, by definition, if you've got um, uh, hostilities taking away a uh, place on this horrific scale, then it's very difficult for the um, humanitarian agent to deliver uh, humanitarian supplies. Mm -hmm. We, by the time this program airs, we may have seen the most horrific, devastating event that has taken place. Aleppo, apparently, is just on the verge of running out of food. No food for any of the 250,000 people left in that city. That is an absolute disaster, humanitarian tragedy. And I'm sure many of our viewers would like to try to help by going to, uh, to the UN World Food Program, uh, www.wfp.org or to unicef.org to contribute and to try to get involved to provide some assistance. But you're right, the combatants on the ground have to stop. They have to take two or three or four steps backwards and then start to negotiate. That will never be resolved militarily, will it? I'm painfully aware of the plight of uh, those poor uh, civilian victims who have uh, got caught in the crossfire. Uh, there is, the good news is that there is no shortage of desire to help. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that the different UN agencies, the larger humanitarian family, Médecins Sans Frontières, mm -hmm. um, um, ICRC, they're all ready, World Food Program. It's not you know, um, uh, something missing uh, here. Right. It's not that. It is just that you cannot deliver assistance when you've got this kind of aerial uh, bombardment taking place, when you've got people on the ground. And it is not a, it is probably the most uncivilized and the most brutal mm -hmm. military action which the two warring sides are undertaking. I mean, the Assad regime has no com uh, 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 compunctions. They're dropping chemical weapons or uh, what looks like chemical weapons, barrels from, from the air. You have people on the ground. Both sides are guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, 
we can look into who, the rights and wrongs of this later but you have to bring this to a stop and unless you bring it to a stop and take people on to the negotiating table and allow the negotiations to take place the difference in the council was never very much mm -hmm. everyone was agreed that Assad had to go the issue simply was whether Assad would step down prior to the negotiating process or he would step down as mm -hmm. part of the uh, outcome uh, which the negotiating process now Gaddafi before him and Assad now are saying that this is a sovereign state which is being attacked by um, terrorists now it's no longer that discussion mm -hmm. so I think Assad's going is not an issue mm -hmm. but I think both sides should sit down starting with the uh, Russians and the Americans and agree to have a proper ceasefire and to put other steps in process so that all the stakeholders then step back if that does not happen in the coming months I'm afraid this is going to escalate and involve the world in other crises because of you know disagreement here mm -hmm. you are uh, an ardent observer of the United Nations you've been on the inside of the United Nations you've looked in from the outside in the last couple of minutes we have are there any recommendations that you would have as to how to improve be it a the Security Council B, the United Nations organization as a whole any organization can stand to be reformed and reform is a word that the, you hear quite frequently at the United Nations but are there some things two or three things that the UN can do to help make it a more effective and a more efficient organization well I'm happy that we are ending with that I mean reform is a much uh, used and if I may be permitted to say much abused term mm -hmm. the existential question that we have to face is the United Nations on its 70th anniversary actually relevant anymore yes I would argue that it has a very important role to play but is it fit for purpose and I think the question should be posed in terms of how can we make the United Nations more fit for purpose mm -hmm. here my recommendation is please take it away please take the emphasis and focus away from chapter 7 and coercive action mm -hmm. do a little more of preventive diplomacy you know of the kind that is deals with uh, conciliation mediation reaching out to people but the proper problem bill is that the UN's budget doesn't have a budget line for prevention mm -hmm. I mean if you want money in the UN you have to create a crisis or you allow a crisis to take place then you go and ask for money so there has to be a complete and fundamental shift well I'm encouraged by the fact that the new Secretary General who has been not only been a Prime Minister of his country mm -hmm. but who has headed the um, uh, UNHCR the High Commissioner for uh, he has been High Commissioner for refugees and a job he has um, uh, done with great distinction he is a believer in preventive diplomacy whether he will be able to we will see but this is an opportunity to reset the moral compass to go back to utilizing the UN's convening power uh, to strengthening its moral authority for preventive diplomacy UN has many successes the SDGs you know the UN if you look at the normative work it has done Universal Declaration of Human Rights mm -hmm. what it has done on women's empowerment the creation of UN women SDGs these are fantastic stories where the UN is found wanting is in the area of peace and security and that's the discussion we are having today we need more preventive diplomacy there absolutely right and I do hope that all the leaders of the world are listening to our program they may very well be some of them are but you're, you've hit it right on the head because we do have to have more of that and to try to circumvent short-circuit these events uh, these wars these uh, political misunderstandings before they get out of control because once they get out of control who knows how far they will go probably five years ago few people thought Syria would be in, in the horrible condition that it is today but we see that it is but you also brought up a very important point too is the United Nations relevant we hear that quite often and I totally agree with you the United Nations is more relevant today than it was at the conclusion of World War II in 1945 because the the problems we face today are far greater they're much more extensive they weren't looking at climate change in 1945 they weren't looking at Ebola virus problems they weren't looking at so many they weren't looking at another Syria but the idea was to bring these nations together and the five winners basically of World War II were going to be the 
permanent members of the UN Security Council. They would come together as a collective force to maintain peace and security in the world. We saw the Cold War started right after that. It didn't go quite the way they had planned, but there is such a role for the United Nations that's absolutely critical to have it because it's often said, if we didn't have the UN today, we would have to create it tomorrow. But Ambassador Purdy, I want to thank you so very much for a thank very you, interesting thank you, and a very informative program. Thank you, thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.